Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort has been made to be as doctrinally and historically accurate as possible. Every day a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants will be released. I hope that you'll visit this often and be able to share this uh, with your friends. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the Doctrine and Covenants podcast. This is going to be for section 18. So let me read the heading first. Revelation to Joseph Smith the Prophet, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer, given at Fayette, New York, June 1829. According to the Prophet, his, this revelation made known the calling of twelve apostles in these last days, and also instructions relative to building up the church. It's interesting that the twelve apostles won't really be organized for several more years. Um, in 1835, they finally get organized, uh, but that's not going to happen for quite a while. So let me go ahead and read a couple things preliminary to the scripture. In preparation for the organization of the church, the prophet had directed Oliver Cowdery to prepare a foundational document for that purpose. Frustrated in his efforts to do so, Oliver asked the prophet to inquire of the Lord for direction on that matter. This section came in response to that request. Describing these events, Joseph Smith said, We had for some time made this matter a subject of humble prayer, and at length we got together in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's house in order order more particularly to seek of the Lord what we now so earnestly desired. And here, to our unspeakable satisfaction, did we realize the truth of the Savior's promise, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For we had not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer when the Lord, when the word of the Lord came unto us in the in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ, and that he also should ordain me to the same office, and then to ordain others, as it should be made known unto us from time to time. We were, however, commanded to defer this our ordination till such time as it should be practicable to have our brethren who had been and who should be baptized, assembled together, when we must have their sanction to our thus proceeding to ordain each other and have them decide by vote whether they were willing to accept us as spiritual teachers or not, when also we were commanded to bless bread and break it with them, and to take wine, bless it, and drink it with them, afterward proceed to ordain each other according to commandment, then call out such men as the Spirit should dictate, and ordain them, and then attend to the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost upon all those whom we had previously baptized, doing all things in the name of the Lord. As a consequence of the instructions given in this revelation, the document known as the Articles of, of Covenant, the Articles and Covenants of the Church, which is section 20, which led to the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was written, and that was by uh, Joseph Fielding McConkie. My understanding, too, is that uh, as they were getting ready to organize the church and decide on how things were going to be run, that that they read back through the uh, Book of Mormon again. And uh, from that, they extracted lots of information regarding the organization of the church, which they used uh, on April 6, 1830, when they organized the church. All right, verse 1. Now, behold, because of the thing which you, my servant Oliver Cadre, have desired to know of me, I give unto you these words. Behold, I have manifested unto you by my Spirit in many instances that the things which you have written are true, wherefore you know that they are true. These words constitute a testimony by God of heaven that the Book of Mormon is true. To say that the book is true means that it is a reliable representation of the truths of salvation. No equivalent statement from the God of heaven exists relative to either the Old or New Testaments or any of the books within them. And that was by uh, Joseph Ely McConkie. Brigham Young said, Oliver Cowdery left the church because he lost the love of the truth, and after he had traveled alone for years, a gentleman walked into his law office and said to him, Mr. Cowdery, what do you think of the Book of Mormon now? Do you believe that it is true? He replied, No, sir, I do not. Well, said the gentleman, I thought as much, for I concluded that you had seen the folly of your ways and had resolved to renounce what you once declared to be true. Sir, you mistake me. I do not believe that the Book of Mormon is true. I am past belief on that point, for I know that it is true, as well as I know that you now sit before me. Do you still testify that you saw an angel? Yes, as much as I see you now, and I know the Book of Mormon to be true. And that was by Eldon Ricks in the case of the Book of Mormon Witnesses. Verse 3, And if you know that they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment, that you rely upon the things which are written. For in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock. 
Of necessity, the church was to be founded on correct principles, principles distinctive to the Restoration, not principles borrowed from some other source. That source is here identified as the Book of Mormon. It is of particular importance to note that the Book of Mormon had to come forth before the organization of the church, for it was to constitute the foundation of the same. So it was that the first copies of the Book of Mormon, 5,000 in number, a rather remarkable expression of confidence, were completed in March 1830, and the church was organized the next month on April the 6th. Verse 5, Wherefore, if you shall build up my church upon the foundation of my gospel and my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Behold, the world is ripening in iniquity, and it must needs be that the children of men are stirred up unto repentance, both the Gentiles and also the house of Israel. Wherefore, as thou hast been baptized by the hands of my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., according to that which I have commanded him, he hath fulfilled the thing which I commanded him. And now marvel not that I have called him unto mine own purpose, which purpose is known in me. Wherefore, if he shall be diligent in keeping my commandments, he shall be blessed unto eternal life, and his name is Joseph. And now, Oliver Cowdery, I speak unto you, and also unto David Whitmer, by the way of commandment. For behold, I command all men everywhere to repent, and I speak unto you, even as unto, my, unto Paul mine apostle. For you are called, even with that same calling with which he was called." Brigham Young taught that Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer were the first apostles of this dispensation. Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer were the first apostles of this dispensation, though in the early days of the church, David Whitmer lost his standing and another took his place. To these, according to Heber C. Kimball, Martin Harris was later added. Peter comes along with James and John and ordains Joseph to be an apostle, and then Joseph ordains Oliver and David Whitmer and Martin Harris, and then they were ordered to select twelve more and ordain them. It was done. These men were instructed to find and ordain twelve others who would from the quorum of the twelve, who would form the quorum of the twelve. Verse 10, remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Let me emphasize that the noblest aim in life is to strive to live to make lives better and happier. The most worthy calling in life is that in which man can serve best his fellow man. Verse 11, that was by David O. McKay. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, wherefore he suffered the pains of all men. How can, you, how can we begin to comprehend the cumulative suffering of all mankind, or as taught by Orson F. Whitney, the piled-up agony of the human race? What is thrown on the scale of remorse, as observed by Truman Madsen, when we aggregate the cumulative impact of our vicious thoughts, motives, and acts? What, as Elder Von J. Featherstone inquired, is the weight and immensity of the penalties of all broken laws crying from the dust and from the future, an incomprehensible tidal wave, tidal wave of guilt? How many searing consciences has this world pro produced, and to what depths of depravity has this earthly sphere sunk? Can anyone possibly fathom the horrendous consequences of such sin? Not only did the Savior fathom it, he felt it, and he suffered it. And that was by Ted Collister in The Infinite Atonement. Continuing verse 11, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. There is nothing in all the eternities, both the love and grace of Christ included, to which conditions are not attached. That which is without conditions is without existence. So it is that we understand that Christ came to save us from our sins, not in them. Through his atonement, Christ brings salvation to all those who shall believe on his name, this being the nature of or the intent of this last sacrifice, to bring about the bowels of mercy, which overpowereth justice, and bringeth about means unto men, that they may have faith unto repentance. And thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice, and encircles them in the arms of safety, while he that exercises no faith unto repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. Therefore, only unto him that has faith unto repentance is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption." Repentance is the condition on which the receipt of all blessings is predicated. And that was by Joseph Fielding McConkie. Verse 13, And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth! Wherefore, you are called to cry repentance unto this people. And if it so be that you shall labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. We need to have the same love for God's children as God does. And now, if your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. 
Rudger Clausen said, And if one of these men should labor all his days and bring save it be one soul unto Christ, and that one soul be his and that should be his wife, what great joy he would have with his wife in heaven. Then if he should labor all his days and bring unto Christ the souls of his wife and his children, and none else perchance, how great would be his joy in heaven with his wife and children. Verse 17, Behold, you have my gospel before you, and my rock, and my salvation, meaning the Book of Mormon. Ask the Father in my name, in faith believing that you shall receive, and you shall have the Holy Ghost, which manifesteth all things which are expedient unto the children of men. Joseph Fielding Smith said, If members of the church would place more confidence in the word of the Lord, and less confidence in the theories of men, they would be better off. I will give you a key for your guidance. Any doctrine, whether it comes in the name of religion, science, philosophy, or whatever it may be, that is in conflict with the revelations of the Lord that have been accepted by the church as coming from the Lord will fail. It may appear to be very plausible. It may be put before you in such a way that you cannot answer it. It may appear to be established by evidence that cannot be controverted, but all you but all you need do is to is to hide your time is to bide your time. Time will level all things. You will find that every doctrine, theory, principle, no matter how great it may appear, no matter how universally it may be believed, if it is not in accord with the word of the Lord, it will perish. Nor is it necessary for us to try to stretch the word of the Lord to make it conform to these theories and teachings. The word of the Lord shall not pass away unfulfilled. The theories of men change from day to day, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Verse 19, And if you have not faith, hope, and charity, you can do nothing. Contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil. The titles Church of the Devil and Church and, and the Great and Abominable Church are used to identify all churches or organizations of whatever name or nature, whether political, philosophical, educational, economic, social, fraternal, civic, or religious, which are designed to take men on a course that leads away from God and his laws and thus from salvation in the kingdom of God. Now it's by Bruce R. McConkie. Verse 21, Take upon you the name of Christ and speak the name in soberness. Speak the truth in soberness. James E. Talmadge said, We are oft times charged with being very exclusive, and we admit the charge. We are exclusive, but in a rational sense. How can we solemnly testify that this is the Church of Jesus Christ and then ascribe that same high title to other organizations that have been formed not under the direction of Jesus Christ, but according to man's thoughts and plans? Some people say that we are illiberal because we do not admit that all other churches are what they profess to be when they when their profession is based on facts. Now, when we say that the Lord is not pleased with the with those churches, we do not mean that he is not pleased with the members thereof. We hold that God is no respecter of persons, but on the contrary that he will be that he will acknowledge good in any soul no matter whether no, no matter whether that person belongs to a church or not. But the Lord is not pleased with those churches that have been con- constructed by men and then labeled with his name. He is not pleased with those doctrines that are being taught as being his doctrines when they are only the effusion of men's brains, undirected by inspiration and utterly lacking in revelation. He has expressed himself with regard to the churches that are built up by man and has said that they shall be overthrown. Indeed, he has applied strong terms to some of those churches or to church organizations in general that have been brought into being by men. Read his words to John the Revelator. See what he means by the synagogue of Satan to which some of the people belonged. Read what he has said about the great and abominable church, the mother of abominations. The church as such may be wholly corrupt because of the false claims that are being made for it, And yet within that church, as members, there may be people who are doing their best. They have been deceived as to the degree of culpability that will be charged up to them for their having become subjects of deception. We may not be able to judge, but I do not understand that when the Lord states that those churches shall be overthrown, I mean the church of the devil using his expression, and those that are making false claims and shall be thrown into the fire, as he says, I do not understand that all members of those churches are to meet destruction physically or otherwise. He is speaking there of the church collectively, and he is not pleased with it, but individually he may be well pleased with many of his sons and daughters who have been under an environment that has led them into those churches which are not of God. Verse 22, And as many as repent and are baptized in my name, which is Jesus Christ, and endure to the end, the same shall be saved. 
Behold, Jesus Christ is the name which is given of the Father, and there is none other name given whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, all men must take upon them the name which is given of the Father, for in that name shall they be called at the last day. Does everyone have to accept Christ? The answer is yes, if they want to be exalted. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my Father, in other words, the celestial kingdom. And now, behold, there are others who are called to declare my gospel, both unto Gentile and unto Jew, yea, even twelve, and the twelve shall be my disciples. These will be the apostles. The Nephite disciples were also apostles. And they shall take upon them my name, and the twelve are they who shall desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart. Again, I mentioned that the twelve won't be called until 1835. And if they desire to take, take upon them my name with full purpose of heart, they are called to go into, the, into all the world to preach my gospel unto every creature. And they are they who are ordained of me to baptize in my name according to that which is written. And you have that which is written before you, wherefore you must perform it according to the words which are written. The baptismal prayer is one of those things that are written. And now I speak unto you, the twelve, behold, my grace is sufficient for you. You must walk uprightly before me and sin not. And behold, you are they who are ordained of me to ordain priests and teachers. And this is Book of Mormon language. To declare my gospel according to the power of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and according to the, go the callings and gifts of God unto men. And I, Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God, have spoken it. These words are not of men nor of man, but of me. Wherefore, you shall testify that they are of me and not of man. For it is my voice which speaketh them unto you, for they are given by my spirit unto you. And by my power, you can read them one to another. And save it were by my power, you could not have them. Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words." As Stillworth Young said, in 1835, the Twelve were chosen, as you know, and on one occasion they were called together and given their instructions. Oliver Cowdery was the spokesman, and after having given them some very powerful and heartwarming instructions, so moved was he himself that he had to stop two or three times to weep. He finally read the revelation to which I refer, and this verse, Brigham Young was so impressed by it that he copied it in his laborious handwriting into his diary. I am impressed by it likewise. These are the words. These words are not of men nor of man, but of me. Wherefore you shall testify they are of me and not of man, for it is my voice which speaketh them unto you. Now this is six years later that they are hearing it, for they are given by my spirit unto you, and by my power you can read them one to another, and save it were by my power you could not have them. And this is the verse, Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words. The thing that impresses me about this, and I have never thought of it before, when I read a verse in the Doctrine and Covenants, I am hearing the voice of the Lord as well as reading his words, if I hear by the Spirit. Now I have heard it said many times by men that they have often asked the Lord for a special testimony and oftentimes haven't had it. They seem to want to hear the voice of the Lord. I confess I have wanted to hear the voice of the Lord without knowing that all these years I have been hearing it with deaf ears. This woke me up. I can testify that having read, I hear the voice of the Lord. I also testify to you that when you hear the prophet here sitting on the stand speak by the voice of, the pro of prophecy and by the spirit of the inspiration which possesses him, you also hear through him the voice of the Lord. And that was in a conference talk given in 1963. Verse 37, And now behold, I give unto you, Oliver Cowdery, and also unto David Whitmer, that you shall search out the twelve, and you shall have the desires of which I have spoken. Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer were given the charge to search out or find those worthy and capable of holding the office of an apostle. As one of the three witnesses, Martin Harris would share in this responsibility. Following the experiences of Zion's camp, the time for choosing arrived in Kirtland on 14th of February, 1835. Joseph paid tribute to those who had marched with Zion's camp and then proposed that the time had come to ordain 12 men to the office of an apostle. President Joseph Smith, Jr. said that the first business of the meeting was for the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon to pray, each one, and then proceed to choose 12 men from the church as apostles to go to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. The three witnesses were Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris, united in prayer. These three witnesses were then blessed by the laying on of the hands of the First Presidency. The witnesses then, according to a former commandment, the present revelation, proceeded to make choice of the twelve. Their names are as follows. Lyman E. Johnson, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, 
Orson Hyde, David W. Patton, Luke S. Johnson, William E. McClellan, John F. Boynton, Orson Pratt, William Smith, Thomas B. Marsh, and Parley P. Pratt. These men were ordained in the quorum according to age from oldest to youngest, and that was by uh, Joseph Philly McConkie. Since this first calling of the Twelve Apostles in this dispensation, there have been a hundred and over a hundred men called as apostles. Seniority in the, in the Quorum of the Twelve was changed to give seniority to the one ordained the earliest. Age did not matter. This change occurred while Joseph Smith was still alive. Verse 38, And by their desires and their works you shall know them, and when you have found them you shall, know, you shall show these things unto them, and you shall fall down and worship the Father in my name. And you must preach unto the world, saying, You must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For all men must repent and be baptized, and not only men, but women and children who have arrived at the years of accountability. And we know that to be age eight. And now, after that you have received this, you must keep my commandments in all things. And and by your hands, God uses us to accomplish his works on earth. I will work a marvelous work among the children of men unto the convincing of many of their sins, that they may come unto repentance, and that they may come unto the kingdom of my Father. Wherefore, the blessings which I give unto you are above all things. And after that you have received this, if you keep not my commandments, you cannot be saved in the kingdom of my Father. Orson F. Whitney said, At far west in April of 1838, <clears throat> Presidents Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmore were excommunicated from the church. The charges sustained against the former <clears throat> were for using vexatious lawsuits against the brethren, slandering President Joseph Smith, contempt of the church in not attending meetings, leaving his calling in which God had appointed him by revelation for the sake of filthy lucre and turning to the practice of law, disgracing the church by being connected in the bogus business, dishonesty, and finally for leaving for, or forsaking the cause of God and returning to the beggarly beggarly elements of the world and neglecting his high and holy calling according to his profession. President Whitmer was, ch was charged with not observing the word of wisdom, neglecting meetings, and possessing the same spirit as the dissenters, writing letters to the dissenters in Kirtland unfavorable to the cause of God and the character of his prophet, neglecting the duties of his calling and separating himself from the church and signing himself president of the Church of Christ after being cut off from the presidency in an insulting letter to the high council. Uh, verse 47, Before, Behold, I, Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God and your Redeemer, by, by the power of my Spirit, have spoken it. Amen. I bear testimony that these things are true, that uh, Joseph Smith's receiving revelation here regarding the how to organize the church and that this will be done uh, in the next few sections. I bear testimony of the truth of the gospel in the, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time.